we are doing another round table on self-care. We have our group together again, which is awesome, and Victoria and Tim. And um, this is just fantastic that we can get together again. Now, our first episode that we did was launched April 13th. <laughs> it was a while ago. And um, I had, I actually, in the last hour, I listened to most of our first episode. And I felt like it was fascinating because there was a few things that um, we didn't know yet. <laughs> like the first thing was, is we didn't know the plan. So we didn't know what remote learning was going to even look like. Um, there was no protests at that time. Mm. Uh, there had been an announcement that every kid in across BC would pass, which has been up to, for debate. Um, and there was also, we were at that point where we were putting hearts on our windows and people were starting to bang pots and pans at seven o'clock, but there wasn't really that social movement that was happening, that, that is currently happening with um, the Black Lives Matter, Lives Matters um, protests. Like, so a lot of our conversation centered around um, how we need people to have more empathy. And there's a few quotes I've written down that I thought were really interesting. Um, so, uh, Victoria, you mentioned this. How are you navigating negative emotions with your kids? Now, that's very interesting because now we're at the very end of our remote learning in term three. That's, it's something to think about because I think we all know that we can't control those negative emotions. And so even moving forward into the September, that's actually a really good question. Um, and then also with the racial and social and all the different protests that are going on now, um, that even, it stacks. There's a stacking now of issues. Um, and you talked about how there was a need for healthy and happy parents, which I find is really interesting now because I think in my journey, at least I've realized that we can't necessarily please all the parents. <laughs> um, Tim, you talked a little bit about learning anywhere and anything and about the need for parents to step up to the plate to start realizing that learning isn't necessarily in a classroom with four walls and desks. So that was interesting. Um, Victoria, you talked a little bit about, and I think this is very important for um, our conversation today. You talked about the importance of the core competencies and how soft skills are something that we see in the business world, but core competencies is something that we really need to focus on for this term three. Um, and you also made this quote, it can't be school as we know it. And so, um, I found those were a few quotes that I kind of took out from you guys. There was definitely more of a focus on empathy. We were also a little, we were also wondering kind of how was this going to play out with like social media but yet I felt like when I was listening to it, it felt like, I don't know if it was like we weren't hitting the nail on the head. Like it felt like we're at a point now where we realize the isolation has actually made people go deeper into conversations about race and prejudice. It's gone, it may, it's forced people to go into conversations about what does education look like and what should it look like. And I, I was just reading on Twitter that I guess Ontario has now come out with a new math curriculum and the math curriculum is going to be on uh, financial literacy and coding. Oh, interesting. Which I find is really interesting and there's other components to it, but they're going to launch that in September. Wow. So um, with that being said, I, you know, I, and if for anyone who's listening right now, um, encourage you to listen to the April 13th, um, podcast episode and now for us to be at the kind of towards the end of the journey of term three what does that really mean for us so I guess to start off um 
Anne, do you want to kind of give us a little bit of insights about where you're at right now? And then maybe we'll go to Victoria and then Tim, and then we'll maybe start a round table of just some, a question or two that we each want to share. Sure. So yeah, it's been a very interesting term um, working with the special needs um, group that was on my caseload this, um, this semester. Uh, it's been an interesting journey. Actually, I found that my relationships with parents went deeper. And uh, the one-on-one -on -one time that I had with students seemed to be quite, like I felt it was really quality, which I really appreciated because I found when you're in the school setting, you just have so many interruptions and there's so many things going on that when you're actually doing um, teams online with a student and being able to concentrate for 45 minutes on a specific lesson or um, skill that you want to teach them there's that there's that ability just to focus so I really I really appreciated that this term to be able to do that with my students and also the team that was around me I really appreciated them so much more so there was a group of three SEAs that worked with me to be able to connect with all these different students that were under my caseload and so us as a team of four really were able to reach out to a lot of these vulnerable students and keep them on our radar. Um, there were some students that people red flagged. There were kids that went off the radar in the classroom on the team, stopped showing up for teams meetings, class meetings, yet would still show up for our meetings with them. So that relationship part really deepened this term. And then also with the parents, I felt like, I strengthened a number of my relationships with parents, whether it was like an email or calling them weekly or whatever. Um, and just how sometimes I felt that some of the families actually just needed, especially the parents, just that connection to say you're on the right track and I'm, we're here to support you. So I felt like my relationships with um, my community definitely deepened this term. And Victoria, how about you? Where are you at right now? Um, that is, that was really, really great. I'm actually really surprised and it's going to be like, it's going to be so interesting to compare all of our different experiences. Um, so pretty much last time we had a conversation, I was in the midst of developing my curriculum and co collaborating with um, a grade seven colleague, uh, Sarah Moore, and her and I were just working really closely together to build um, things that made sense that pushed our kids um, academically while really focusing on those competencies of, again, like that, that communication and that personal awareness and responsibility um, coming together to share things with the broader group. Um, and we had a lot of fun with that. Um, but kind of as, as the term started out, it was really, really positive. Like a lot of kids found a lot of success. People were doing assignments. It was, it was awesome. And then kind of as the term progressed, I should, I should add in here, I was encouraged at the very beginning to um, be as asynchronous as possible while kids uh, got used to and, and parents got used to the format of distance learning or remote learning. Um, and so we didn't really have, we had like a class meeting once a week kind of thing, but we didn't really have lessons that were you know, set days and you had to come. And um, so that wasn't really um, brought into the schedule from the get-go. And so I say this to say like that synchronous piece was massively missing at the beginning. And I think it really impacted our relationships as we went because kids were maintaining their relationship with me and me, them by Teams chat. And that is pretty superficial. Like that's me kind of I mean, if you think about instant messaging with, with teenagers, especially like that's their world. And all of a sudden their teacher is messaging them in their world, um, on platforms that look like their social platforms. Um, so I say all of this saying, you know, I'm an advocate for pedagogy with tech, but that doesn't make me an effective distance learning teacher by any means. Um, yes, we were effective with like how things were organized, but as the term wore on and everyone got used to that setup, some of their engagement with these things waned a lot. And so we found ourselves chasing kids often. Um, and this could be in part due to many things like I teach grade seven. So that's their last year of elementary school could be a little bit of senioritis. Um, there's just remote learning doesn't work for some kids. 
So I kind of started to change things up and brought more synchronous pieces in. And that was much better to just have those touches and work with kids more closely. Um, So obviously that's something I'm going to change moving forward just from the get go. It's an expectation that you're there. Um, There is nothing like being stood up by a 13 year old on a zoom call. (laughs) I'll tell you that. Um, And I found with kids, I think for them, it was like almost higher stakes to ask questions or accept help. We had kids who were just not accepting the the many, many olive branches extended to them to support them, um, or just plain not asking questions um, when given the opportunity to do so. Um, So that was that was really challenging. And getting back to class in June, um, I was a little bit like approaching that with trepidation, but it was so therapeutic, just reinstating that in-person rhythm of the relationships that already existed. And it was like we had never left. And I think that was really, really good for me. And it was really, really good for the kids who attended. Um, So all in all, definitely reflecting, making changes next year, um, depending on what we get served. And yeah, it was a roller coaster this whole way through. And Tim, how about you? What are your thoughts? Well, the the experience on online was so varied from teacher to teacher. It's like you, you can ask one teacher and they'll exp- ex- ex- express one experience and, and, and you'll ask another and another. And, and you ask 12 teachers, you got 12 different experiences. Um, in my situation, what I tried to do was make programs available to kids and I did see an interaction with the programs, but I did see also that wane over time. So as the, as we got closer to the end, the percent turn in rate definitely dropped. And uh, this is, well, so what it made me think though was, to do this successfully online. And if we move forward into a hybrid situation next year, boy, you sure have to think it through about what's a valuable online experience. Because if they're gonna do it, it it better be kind of worth their time. And I and I get that. I I get that they're they're gonna be discerning and, and they don't want look, this is tough enough. I don't want busy work. Let me do something that's got some value to it. And so um especially as well when we know that we probably can't expect as much. So what we do give had better be good quality. So we can't, we can't stick with, well, this is an assignment I've always used. I'll just put it on my online now. Um, But regardless of all of that, I am convinced that the online situation can work if people buy into it. I had some experiences with students that I could probably say they learned more and had a more valuable experience educationally online than if they had stayed here. For example, one student who is a good student right from the beginning said, boy, I sure like the online. I, I, it's so stressful for me to come to school every day. The social pressures, where do I eat lunch? Those sort of, I could just stay at home now. Those pressures are gone. And I just love it. I wanted to stay online, he said. And this is a very good student too. Um, through, to, through to other experiences where, where kids, they seem, to, they seem to delve into it and, and they got more creative with what they were turning in. So instead of maybe turning in an assignment on paper, a more traditional way, I had people doing audio recordings and video recordings. and they were more engaging, they were more interesting, and I feel like they're more transferable skills as well. So, boy, what a, what a, a broad array of experiences. There's no one thing that you could say, uh, here's, here's what it was all about. It was like almost a different thing for, for every different person. But I am convinced that it can be done online. Now, here's one last thought on that, is moving forward, why would why would the courses that we teach be now limited to the schools that we teach in? Like from now forward, if, if, I, if I know of a program at a particular school, but I don't go to that school, darn, I guess I miss out. Well, there, today, there's no reason why you should miss out anymore. 
And I'm hoping that as we move forward, uh, an opportunity exists for students to take more courses, some of them in a, in, in a classroom setting and some of them in an online setting, whether there's a virus or not, why is education not open distribution? So that if I live in Walnut Grove, well, I guess I take courses that are offered at Walnut Grove, but what if I don't live there? What if I live in um, Prince George? but I want to take a course that's offered at that school in Langley. Well, in my opinion, now you can, you should yeah. be able to. Yeah, good idea. So I'm hoping that that's what moves. I, I think it would be a real shame for all the work we put in to try and make this work to go back to the way things always were, it would be an absolute social crime. Yeah. Well, and on that point, my husband had a student uh, this term who was stuck in Korea. So mm. she continued to learn the information from, you know, his class, but they were in Korea. And I also have another yeah. colleague at, at school who teaches kindergarten and she was saying one of her students was in Hawaii. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, when you think about it, there's so many more <laughs> options out there now, right? So if and I, you, you know, if I moved or, you know, if, I move out to Nova Scotia, right? Like, oh, but I want my daughter to still take Tim Stevenson's uh, science class, right? Do you know what and, I mean? She's, and she's as, as a girl, why can't she continue, right? And as a, as a teacher. Questions, right? There's a, real, a lot of curiosities with that, and that's good. As a teacher, why, why should I be limited to um, what I, what if there's a course I've always wanted to teach? Now, what school districts and administrators should be looking for is, is, is um, you know, what else can we offer? What would you like to offer as a teacher rather than, um, oh, I got this course again. Oh, I got that grade again. But I really wanted to do that or that. Now, you should be able, if we're going to really be a progressive, like, finally, let's wake up and say we are in the 21st century. We are now 20 years in. My gosh, let's start acting like it. So maybe there's an opportunity now to say, well, you know what I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to teach this. I want to do a specialized program in that. I'm really quite good at it. I know a lot about it. Can I, can I please do this? And, um, and so uh, that, that is what I'm hoping we, we see as we go forward. And if, if we don't, we'll be um, kind of be taking a step backwards. Yeah, I really like that idea. And I was talking to a colleague recently who suggested actually a creation of a new district in BC that could just be remote learning. Yeah. You could even wow. contract different people from different districts. Hey, you really love science. Hey, what subjects do you want to teach? Hey, we're going to contract you out. And so just like, you know, there's different districts in the province that this would be a district with people who are passionate and specialists about certain topics. And that, you know, somebody, you know, who's interested contacts the district and says, you know, I'm interested in a science space class. Who teaches that? Oh, so-and-so in Delta. Or, yeah, Tim. Tim does. <laughs> the little hand. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, so, you know what I mean? Where you're pulling from expertise from across BC and then you you get this plethora of that we are a learning community together. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, so-and-so, this district is doing this, and this district is doing that, and that has a great program there, but that one has a great program there. That I love it. a collaborative group where people can invest in enriching our education system. Yeah. Yeah. There's people all over the place. The, the, the three of you, I would love to work in a school with the three of you. No. But I can't, right? No. Well, maybe I can now. I mean, that's the sort of thing. I love that idea of having an online district and you could apply to the position, tell the administrators what you would like to offer and, and then build the school from there. And it would be, I suspect, those kind of growth mindset teachers who say, this sounds like a great idea and what a great opportunity for students to learn an unlimited number of things. Um, whoever, who came up with that idea? You know, actually it wasn't a colleague, it was my husband. Oh, your husband. Yeah, Sam, who teaches at Tree Western. Yeah. Sam yeah, for- uh, It was him. Yeah, he said that to me the other night and I was like, hey, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. Because why not? Good. You know what I mean? 
there's a French, you know, francophone district, right? That's across the province. Why not a remote learning? Interesting idea. Yeah. Well, guys, do you, I don't know if any of one, anyone has any questions to give to our round table. I have one single one. Um, does anyone have a specific question they want to share? And then we go around. Sure, I can share a question. Do you okay, want to go why don't you start, start, Anne? Is there a so recently somebody said to me, which was very interesting, is, you know, when you went for your job interview, say it was in the last like five years, and somebody said to you, where do you see yourself five years from now? <laughs> yeah, you couldn't imagine yourself in this situation. <laughs> I'd be teaching through a computer. <laughs> So I'm going to pose that question to you guys, but I'm going to shorten it. Where do you see yourself two years from now? So June, 2022. Well, I think for me, I am, um, well, I'm moving to the middle school, you were, so I could, I, I would see myself there. Um, there are a number of people out there that feel like we're going to be done this pandemic in the next year. I don't think so. I think we're going to be in and out of schools for the next couple of years. Um, so I think in two years from now, I will have gained, I don't know, more of more confidence in my, my distance learning program. And I think I would be a little bit more grounded. I feel like the last term has been a roller coaster. So I would say in two years from now, I'll still be teaching at the middle school, but I will have a distance learning program that feels a little bit more grounded and a little bit more me. Does that make sense? No, Victoria, what about you? This is a tough one. Um, and it's kind of just because of my, my station in life right now. So I have a young son and he is two and, um, my husband and I have talked about growing our family more. Um, and COVID sort of like, we, we really don't really know what to do right now because of everything that's going on. You know, there's these big predictions of a, of a significant second and possibly third wave. I actually just moments ago, like before this call, um, watched this pretty bone chilling um, epidemiologist talk about just this the second wave being prominent and probably worse than the first. Um, and we didn't really experience this significantly in BC, not, um, not to the degree that other regions of our populace experienced this. Um, so I, I want to say that by June 2022, hopefully I have another family member and I might be on mat leave. Um, but I, I think career-wise, I'll still be probably where I am until that family growth is done, um, just in terms of consistency for, for myself and for my family. Making changes in my career is not something that I take very lightly um, it, because I'm, I'm a horrible perfectionist. I always want to do really well at it. So um, when I make a change, I go all in and um, I can't see me moving grades. I do hope that the structures change somewhat too, as Tim mentioned, just in terms of the way that the ways that kids and families can access things. But I also, I guess I bring some of the pragmatism and the, the questioning side of, um, you know, dreaming forward all of that innovation in that, like, I burnt at both ends, the candle burnt at both ends all term. And I'm not sure how to maintain that and um, change things for the future. So that's just my question and something I'm focusing on as I recharge this summer. Um, I'm hoping to kind of be in a similar position career wise, hopefully have grown my family by then, but just really start to understand how to balance some of these new things that are coming in without overdoing it for my mental health and the health of my family, right? Um, that's just been a big focus. And as we talk about self-care and wellness, like that's also got to come, come ahead of the job sometimes. So. Mm. Tim, and, your and, thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, probably four years from being able to retire two years from now you never know what you know, a person starts to think in terms of uh, 
changing careers, right? Uh, if I had that option, but the only reason I would is if there was something available for me to step into along these lines, uh, to be able to move to a position of, I, I would like to move to a position of influence on the direction of teacher training. Um, even even education um, uh, pro d these sort of things that um, and I say so because i need I need people like Victoria to say i 'm the pragmatic person who questions everything because i 'll jump in and as i 'm falling i 'll start thinking, oh, I wonder if this <laughs> yeah, but i'm already i 'm already halfway down right should have asked this at the beginning. Oh, well, now I got to make this work. Um, so I, I do have that personality that will say, um, I, want, I, want, I want to help. I want to move this forward. And I think I want to provide people with training and ideas. That's what I would love to be able to do. I, I, I'd love to take the education to a point where it's, it's extending beyond just my classroom. I'm really looking for those sort of opportunities. Um, I've, I've found that this COVID time, to, to me, and again, this is my personality, and it's not everybody's, but I, I've seen it as just one large opportunity after another educationally. And um, I want, if, if people don't understand that, I'd like to sit down with them for an afternoon and explain to them what I mean, and maybe I can help with their practice as well and, and give them some ideas. So. Um, 2022 if i could be doing that i'd be i'd be pretty pumped because i'm not ready to walk away from education by any stretch of the imagination but i'm i am thinking that uh, changing the uh, the focus that of, of my time is definitely on the horizon and did you want to speak to your question at all Sure. So yeah, for September, I'm uh, been seconded by Simon Fraser University to be a faculty associate for the graduate studies program. So I'm super excited about that. Mm. So yeah, uh, for 50% FTE. So I'm going to be one day a week at James Kennedy, and then I'll be teaching a makerspace uh, pedagogy graduate studies program. So probably in Langley and Surrey. So I think actually, Tim, some of your colleagues from Walnut Grove are in one of the cohorts currently. So oh. I'll be seeing some of your Walnut Grove colleagues. So yeah, I kind of see myself with that program two years from now. And I will probably, I don't know, maybe stay at, I'll probably be at James Kennedy. I don't know what kind of FTE I'll be there, but I kind of see this as a new season for me in diving into supporting teachers and diving into the whole makerspace thing which is definitely on my heart and has been on my heart for um, years now with the inspire project and just bringing that inclusion and the making and the coding um, together into a beautiful partnership to see a lot of these kids who are on the peripheries being successful and being connected um, so yeah, I see myself two years from now doing that. And yeah, just this whole new world. I think it'll be interesting. And it would be great two years from now if we did this again. <laughs> <laughs> and see all the different changes that has happened. Um, I'm really hopeful for the education system. I'm hoping that we will... Uh, learn new things in this journey it'll make education stronger i really hope and pray that our vulnerable students especially are supported in the ways that they need that support and uh even when budget cuts happen that we're still able to reach those kids on the periphery so i'm very hopeful that the future is bright and uh we'll all be you know, speaking into young minds and hearts and um, people that are that come across our path. So, yeah, here's to 2022. <laughs> and Victoria, did you want to say anything? Well, um, um, I'm, I'm interested to hear um, Victoria and Tim's question, if you happen to have one. Do you guys have a question? If not, that's cool. I have one up my sleeve right now. Go for it. Okay, Victoria, do you do you have any thoughts about any? 
I, I do. I wonder if it's better placed after yours. We'll see. <laughs> okay. So this is my question. Now, this came about after, after I was listening to the podcast. Okay. So this is back in April 13th, right? It was posted. So if you could tell yourself anything, go back in time to spring break about what kind of has happened in term three advice you could give yourself a question you could you have you have two minutes to talk two minutes what would you say to yourself back at spring break two minutes to talk what do you think do we know that this was going to happen is yes yeah. you knew you knew you were moving into remote learning you knew that this was this was inevitable you knew that people were banging pots and pans at seven o'clock and hearts were on the windows. You knew you were in the middle of a pandemic. You knew this was going to happen. What would you have told yourself? I would have told myself, uh, start, start creating, start creating an, an online presence that's going to be um, meaningful and valuable to, to your students, because if you're not going to see them, I, I, I knew right from the beginning that, um, I didn't think a, I didn't think synchronous teaching would work. It wasn't long before all the memes and the funny TikToks and things were coming out about uh, synchronous teaching and uh, how how screwy that could get. So I I just knew then that if if I can't be there, if I can't bring the lessons that I wanted to bring, then um, uh, I I would I knew that I needed to start producing something. So the advice I would, of course, what I was saying to myself back that I do know is I was saying, hey. Wouldn't it be funny if two weeks from now, this was still going on? I remember saying that. And here it is like three months. <laughs> but um, that's what, um, right away, you think, all right, Tim of three months ago, we're in this. So what are you going to produce that's going to make your students continue to learn and make it engaging and, and, and valuable to them? And you better start making a list because um, uh, otherwise it's going to be a pretty, pretty tough thing to, to continue. So. I would say it's funny because I think we play off each other really well, Tim, because there's, you know, like I, I hear you and kind of get a little bit of validation on that. I didn't do this synchronous teaching, but on the, on the flip side of that, the other thing that I discovered was the self-directed learning that came with here, watch this video here, do this, this work that goes with it. I'm here at these office hours to check in with me. That's very much coming from the inside of the student that had that motivation to do that to complete that um, needs to come from the inside of the student and I, I feel like I would have told myself more synchronous opportunities um, now now to be clear like I don't mean every day at x time I mean like a couple of specific check-ins with students whether that's with a group or an individual or the whole group um, that was more mandatory. Sorry, my cat's being annoying. Um, but I think I would go back and tell myself, like, you know, once they're settled into the rhythm, synchronous needs to be somewhere. Um, and I think I would also tell myself to remember that the engagement will wane and that um, the stuff that you did needs to start getting dialed back probably sooner than you think. Um, we, we had our term deadlines kind of set mid month and um, kids really, really struggled to get stuff in, even with when we stopped really assigning new stuff um, at the beginning of the month. So I think just everything takes a little bit longer and to always keep that in the back of your mind um, when you're not there to directly support kids. I think definitely if I was in, in your shoes and teaching in your school, uh, I would definitely have set synchronous time up as well. Because I think it would have been a very valuable thing for those younger kids and the ones that I teach to to see you and to listen to you. And um, so I think that was probably not even probably, I think that was definitely the right thing to do to set up those. Um, but boy, one thing you said is for sure is, is the amount of time, like the, when I'm dealing with a class in a classroom, I can get my message across all at the same time. And online, it was like one student at a time. So instead of five conversations 
to 25 people per, now it's 125 conversations to one at a time. And that, boy, what a time consuming thing that was all day long. Uh, It's never stopped. You kind of get... You get to a place where I like I actually got to a position where I could copy and paste my responses <laughs> from one question to another question because it got asked enough times and I could start to predict which questions would get asked. And so my criteria got a lot more hefty or like any kind of added detail students would need. But I also found that kids, if things got too big, they wouldn't read it or they wouldn't watch it or whatever. So you also have to watch that. Um, the delivery piece, right? How much are you throwing at kids? And then of course they're going to have questions and how are you going to support that without it being too much more reading or too much more watching? And it wasn't too long to figure out that the students who responded were the same ones every time. So I'd have the same dozen students who would quickly reply and respond to my comments or messages, but it was the same kids every single time. So where were the other 120 kids? Why weren't they responding? Presumably, they saw the message, but um, uh, that would be something moving forward is if I were to give myself advice, it would be right off the bat, say to the students, you've got to engage. It's got to be like, it's on you to engage with me. I'm here all the time, but are you? And I can't, I can't force you to, but if you, like, like I said, some students had better experiences quite possibly than if they were in the classroom. But those are the ones who took the bull by the horns and engaged with me, firing me questions that I didn't even ask them to, yet they were doing it. And um, if I could have gotten more students to do that, it would have been a more valuable experience for more people. So starting out at the beginning, I probably should have said to everybody, make it your priority to engage with me. And you will learn whether we're in school or not. And those who did had a great experience. I, I really believe that. But those who didn't, well, they kind of drifted away and there was nothing I could do to bring them back. Yeah, I think that's the hard thing. I think that connection part is uh, something that you realize needs to be there, especially in these kind of seasons of remote uh the things that i would have said to myself was connection remember that you can make an effort in connection but it may not always be reciprocal (laughs) and that's okay like sometimes it's just one of those things that you need to just know that you're there for the student the family knows that you're there for the student and that if you've attempted and they uh they don't reciprocate. It's okay. I was talking to one of my students and he hung up on me (laughs) like in mid sentence. And then I phoned him back and it just went to answering service three times in a row. (laughs) So it was like, it was one of those things that, and then I got an email from his mom saying, Oh, I'm sorry. He somehow hung up on you. (laughs) So, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, we're here, we're here to support you. But at the end of the day, it's realizing that they have a choice in that. And um, when they're in the school building, you can just kind of pull up a chair next to them or say, I'm going to come back in an hour because they're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> but they, they have the power to, uh, you know, receive that message or not. So I would have said that to myself. Also, be aware of how much screen time you have because <laughs> I realized in the month of April, I was just screen, screen, screens. And I felt myself, my eyes were getting exhausted. I was getting tired. I couldn't fall asleep right away. Like I felt that the screw, I had kind of over almost overdosed in screens, especially the month of April. We had a lot of staff meetings, a lot of student meetings, connecting with all the different teachers, classrooms. Um, I would have said, you don't have to be everywhere. (laughs) <laughs> for everyone all the time and to give yourself a break. So I think those two things, the connection bit and uh, the screen bit would have been two points of wisdom I would have shared with myself. 
I am very curious to see how busy optometrists are yeah. with mm-hmm. eye issues mm-hmm. in the next mm-hmm. year. Like just my, my own optometrist gets mad at me in regular times for being on my screen too much. So that'll be an interesting one. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Victoria, do you have an answer to your own question? Yeah. I don't know. It's a hard one. <laughs> I think I think one of the things that I think I would tell myself is be kind to myself, like, and give myself grace. Like, there were times where I was answering emails for, like, two hours, like, <laughs> one morning waking up at six, and I was literally answering emails for two hours, like, and I... I just think to myself, like, I, I, I worked really hard. And I think that I probably say that to myself. I probably say, you're good. You're about to work really, really hard. And there's going to be a lot of people that don't see that work. It's going to be invisible, but you need to give yourself grace. So that piece about, you know, what Anne was just saying about the screen Like, I think there were times where I probably should have walked away from the screen and I just continued, you know, and then you end up with a headache at the end of the day. You know, so I think it would just be, be kind to myself and uh, yeah, you're going to work hard and be prepared for that. So, Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, that's what I would probably say to myself. Um, I know that, Anne, you have to go soon, right? And you have to go soon, two o'clock? Yeah, okay. So um, I do is there any last comments or any reflections? I know our first one on April 30th, what, our 13th was on self-care, but was there anything that you guys wanted to share or any thoughts or any questions or any any kind of wrap up? We're, we're at the end of June. Um, I'm going to just, my, I I guess I'll kind of frame my question, the, like the question, not that you guys have to answer it, but just maybe some awareness for ourselves of what I was hoping to get from it from you guys. So next year, we're going to be facing uncertainty still. Um, we're going to be moving probably in and out of these different forms of instruction throughout the year. And just to remember that the impact that has only on you it's not just you, it's not just your students, but it's also the families. My big reflection from the end of this is just how incredibly hard the families at home have had to work. And yes, I think as Tim mentioned from a previous our previous episode, it's a call to parents to step up. But at the same time, they've also got their responsibilities, whether it's work or other family members, or maybe they have a child that has specific needs that makes this all the more challenging. So just always remember... Um, and Victoria's advice recently, be kind and be empathetic toward all of the different circumstances that you have, that your students have, that your families of your students have. Um, Because I think next year will be just as big as of a roller coaster (laughs) as we've experienced this year. I, I, um, I've been thinking about uh, growth mindset a lot and it's a it's a theme in our school district for sure. Uh, that book by Carol Dweck has gone around to a lot of book studies and pro D events, and um, it is it is now more than ever required that we think to ourselves, um, "I got to learn this, and I'm, I need to I need to figure this out." And it's not going to be uh, fast and easy, but um, in small bites, I'll, I'll take it on. Uh, I, I do think that that's a, a theme that I hope we all take forward is growth. And uh, you've probably heard it a many, many times in the last month or so that we've done more pro D in the last three months than you will in an entire career. Uh, we're now pretty good online and we figured out these different platforms and ways to deliver our messages uh, our lessons evaluating without seeing a person these are all incredibly difficult things to do and yet um i guess it's the end of june and we've i guess we've done it we've we've done that whether whether it was great or not we have done it and uh moving forward i just hope that everybody has a growth mindset and believes that you have it in you and then as well that there's a community of people in your circle in your in your pln that 
that is available to bounce ideas off of and to um, share ideas and, and to grow together. And, and I hope that people grow, but I hope they don't try to grow alone. I hope that they grow together in seek out groups like this where you'll feel that support and you'll realize you're not alone. And um, together we, we, can, uh, we can do this. And it will be, as, as Victoria said, it will be very different next year. It will not be anything like this. It will be, continue to be a roller coaster. All the more reason then to start seeking out that group of teachers that you know you can trust, you'll know will be a valuable time spent with. And, uh, and focus your energy on them. The negative, the negative Nellies that we all know exist just don't spend your time on them. Focus on the people you know can help you grow, and um, um, we'll we'll get our, we'll get it, we'll get each other through this together. Yeah, I just echo everything you've said. Really, I just think it's so important um, to just realize why did we go into teaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, we get wrapped up with all the different things and all the curriculum and all the marking and all our report cards. But why we go into teaching, right? We went into teaching because we love kids, we love students, we love seeing them learn, we love seeing that spark, we see love that relationship and that connection. And I just think it's amazing that if we can keep the reason why we're in this job at the forefront, then I think we are going to be able to navigate this year and the years ahead because it's so easy to get wrapped up in, well, what's our school district going to do? And what's going to happen next? And, you know, so-and-so's not wearing a mask or so-and-so coughed and, you know, and it just can all steal your joy sometimes. And I know it's, it's stolen mine sometimes throughout this term. And so I just, yeah, I just, my hope and dream is that we would continue to remember that why did we go into teaching and to continue to love, love the students that are in front of us and that are part of our village and even our staff, like our staff, some of our staff are going through some really hard stuff and just to be there for them and to just speak into that village and be with that village. So, yeah. Well, here we are at the very end of June, and um, I just want to thank all of you for being part of this conversation in April, but also in June and kind of walking through this um, experience and sharing your thoughts and insights and heart into what just happened to us. <laughs> and I think I think I not only speak for myself, but say like, it's going to take some time to process this. <laughs> and we also, you know, um, as Tim was saying about the growth mindset, like moving forward, being able to think positively and be resilient. Um, and I know Victoria um, has talked about empathy, not only on the, the April episode, but this episode as well. And I just think, you know, between growth mindset empathy and you know and Anne talked a lot about connections connections like all of those three things are just so important as we move into the fall and yeah there's a lot of unknowns but we do know that we will be resilient we know that we'll continue to connect and we'll continue to hopefully focus on a growth mindset so with that being said we're going to sign off from the COVID-19 ed podcast Monday episode and um, once again thank you and Victoria and Tim for joining me today and doing the roundtable. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. on and off.